Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on me running Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark RPG. Uh, this is part 7. Um, in this, I'm going to go over what we did in our last session. We played yesterday, finally, for the first time in like three weeks. And then I'm going to talk about what I'm going to be preparing for our next session, which is sort of the climax of Season 1, and I think it's going to end perfectly. Um, so it was a really great session. They didn't do anything that I thought they were going to do. They went back to the church. Um, I, I didn't expect them to do that. They were kind of planning on going around. Um, well, so what happened um, in, in the one before this, remember the, uh, if you guys have watched that video, you'll know that the, um, the inn was attacked during the night by Father Donovich, who was a vampire, and by Gertruda. Donovich broke into the upper floor. There was a scuffle. He was turned by, um, by, the, uh, by the priest in the party by Ulysses. And Ulysses, um, yeah, so turned him, and he, he jumped out the window, crawled back into the street, and then Gertruda came up to the house and started banging on the door, and Ismark uh, forbade her entry. As Burgomaster Barovia, he revoked any invitation that uh, she may have had to the public house. Um, he banned her from it, essentially. I, for, you know, I, I revoke your, um, I think he just said, I, I forbid your entrance or something like that as Burgomaster Barovia. And so she and Donovich wandered off into the darkness. Well, the party basically rested up all that night, and then as the sun began to rise, that was the end of our last session. And so this session began right there. And Ismark said, you've got to get out of here. You've got to get my sister out of here. You have to go. And the players questioned it, like, well, why do we need to get her out of here? Why are you so certain that they're after her? Because the night before, they didn't mention anything about Irina. They only wanted the book, the book which um, the party knows is in the possession of uh, Varya, one of the players. That's all that Gertrude asked for. In fact, she said, give us the book and we'll let you all go. We'll leave you alone. But Ismark was insistent. Okay, you know, you have to get my sister out of here. And they said, look, we all have to get out of here. This town is dead. There's only a handful of people left. Um, it's, it's dead. You know, it was honorable of you to try to save people. There's no way we can do that. So get out of here. Um, because Gertruda and Donovich both said they'd be back. So if we spend another night in town, and the party sort of debated this. One player was like, we cannot spend another night in town. And the other party member was like, I think we should, because the alternative is, is spending the night in the woods. Velaki in this game, Velaki is about 14, 15 hours away by the road. Or if you cut through the woods maybe cutting three hours off of that, 12 hours. And so if you leave at seven in the morning, you get there at seven at night, sun only really rises around 7.30 or eight in this world, and it begins to set around 7 p.m., 6.30, 7 p.m. And so um, there's not that much daylight in this time of the year. So assuming nothing goes wrong and you cut through the woods and you're traveling pretty quickly, you can get from Barovia to Velaki in a day. That's kind of how I'm putting it. But the the players didn't want to leave these townsfolk on their own, and there are children with them, Mary is with them, she's very ill, and they're like, we can't make it there in a day. So the, the, the decision was either we stay here for another night or we risk it in the woods for a day, and uh, and for a night, and then get to Velaki maybe the next day. And so this was the di discussion the players were having. They, um, they were a bit... Some of them said, well, maybe we could also go to the Zerpool camp with the Vistani and figure out what's going on. That could be an option. Um, some people said, well, maybe we should um, try to go find the two women who went missing. Maybe that's something we could look into. Uh, no one mentioned Eric or anything like that. Um, and then I had Doru mention, you know, I have a prayer book down in the cellar of the church. It has a blessing prayer. And also my armor and, and, and uh, sword are down there. I have this old antique set of armor. And, and a sword that I could I could use. And the players are like, oh man. And he said, oh, also there are the, the relics in the altar. The players are like, oh man. Okay, well that's another option then. So the players decided what they were gonna do was basically they were gonna ignore Irina's insistence on going to the camp, the Zerpool camp. They were like, nope, that's not happening. We're not gonna split up. We're not gonna waste our day. We're going to go down into the church. We're going to get what we need to get down there. Um, and then we're going to get back to the inn. Everyone's going to go, and we're all going to leave together. That was the idea. We're all going to leave together. So, Doru follows the party into the church, um, and it's clear that um, 
that bitter smell which Pavel the Beast smelled on the corpse of Sorbia, it's still present to the church. They're like, okay, Father Donovich is here somewhere. He's probably down below. But then they realize, no, some of these bodies have fallen from up above in the gallery. Maybe he's up above in some attic or something. So they decided to go down into the crypt, and they really quickly got what they needed to get. They got their armor, they got the weapon, and they got the book from Dora's room. And then they checked into the storage room, and they got um, uh, a barrel full of oil, uh, 15 uses of oil, um, down here, 16 and 17 on my uh, dungeon list here. And then they heard something coming down from the long hallway, and, and Dora said, oh, the, there is the holy symbol in Father Arcady's tomb. Now, I was sort of mixing things up here. Um, Father Arcady's tomb has, does have the holy symbol, but then there are these dark totems. And I realized, you know, on the map here, let's see if I can open it up. Oops, that's the wrong map here. I had set these up as room 23 and then 24, all the Father Arcady's room is 24, and the dark totems were in 23, but I realized there wasn't really a fight in 23 for them to do. And, it, you know, I wasn't really keen on having this be a whole dungeon. I, I started to run it that way, so I'll tell you what I mean. And it didn't fit. It just didn't fit the tone. Things really, really shifted. And, and not in a way that was positive. I, I mean, at least I thought it was a bit of a lateral move at best. So anyway, they were down in Dora's room in 17. They went up and they saw that this had been broken open. This door had been broken open. The door from 15 into the 18, into hallway 18. So they followed it. And at the first turn here into room A, into this crypt, they found skeletons. But these were like weird skeletons that had been fused together with a bunch of different bones and bodies and, and you know, sort of a creepy image. But they failed their stealth check and the skeletons rushed at them. And they rushed at Pavel, who was in the front rank, and they did a bunch of damage. One got a crit, and I think another one couple hit. And so, and they won initiative. It was a surprise round for the rest of the party. Pavel failed his initiative. Um, did some damage to them, but then they attacked him, and they took him to zero hit points. Now, he's the beast, which means he immediately transforms. And so, right then and there, boom, right away, Pavel turns into the beast. His clothes shred, he drops his equipment, and he becomes this monster. And he was being... He was so powerful. The beast is a really, really powerful thing. It does advantage on its D8. I'm, I've ruled that that magic is magic damage. Um, that the, the damage that the beast does in its beast form is magic damage. Otherwise, it's a really weak class. Um, and I also ruled that it gets to add one plus one damage per uh, half its level rounded down. So right at this point, Pavel's level three, so he gets to add plus one damage. So he's rolling two D8, taking the higher for his damage, and he gets plus one, and it's magic damage. So he is a beast, like really. And he was tearing into these skeletons, just shredding them. Well, the party was sort of surprised. He had dropped hints in character about... No, they all knew what he was. Play, the players all knew. But in character, they all had, um, had had hints of this. Arthur had known something about this when he was captured by the cult. Um, Varya had been told. Ulysses was the only one that really kind of had no idea. But the player played it off really well. In fact, I think he was the only one that played it very well. Varya and... Pop, uh, and, and uh, and Arthur, they played it like it was, they were really casual about it. They were like, yeah, wow, that's kind of creepy. Um, let's keep going. And then, you know, they're, they're this beast, this their companion whom they've never seen before just morphs into this wolf hybrid thing. Um, Ulysses was the only one who played it, I think, really well, the character, or the, the player for Ulysses. He, he, like, pointed his gun at him, which had jammed during the fight, which was really cool. Uh, and he, like, clicked it. He was like, give me your gun, give me your gun. And they were like, no, 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 it's, you know, it's him. And he was like, uh, and Pavel, the beast, was like, friend, not not enemy or something. He did some kind of like half kind of guttural speech. And they were like, oh, okay, good. Uh, and Ulysses was was wary. But Doru just took off running. Because Doru was like, you have the curse of the Vistani. And they're like, oh, okay, so this is a thing that, that's just, that is at least said about the Vistani, that they have this this curse of, of wolf, or werewolfism or whatever, lycanthropy. So he ran. And uh, the party, uh, Varya chased him down. The rest of the party continued on because uh, he ran up the stairs and, and Varya didn't want him to get back to town and tell everybody, hey, you know, you have a curse member. So she stopped him at the door and then they heard like this half um, call of Doru's name from somewhere above in the church in the gallery. Like, Doru. And it was, you know, uh, so I, I kind of messed up. They didn't question it and I'm happy that they didn't question it um, because during the day, technically the vampires are sleeping. They, they repose during the day. So I was a little bit confused about... I, I wanted this kind of creepy moment, and I was like, well, maybe I'll play it off as it was in Dora's head, but no, Varya heard it too, and I just kind of described it too late. And, and so I, I just kind of moved on from it. Um, and the, the 
you know, the players didn't think about it or they didn't bring it up. Again. That, that, hey, how does that make sense if he's sleeping? Because they found him sleeping later. Um, well, I'll get to that. So anyway, they, she stopped Doru and she was like, no, 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 come back down. And Doru, she made some checks and Doru was like, all right, I'll, go down. I'll come down. Um, and so she led him back down into the crypt. Now, meanwhile, they had passed by all these other crypts. And this is what I meant when I said that it felt a little dungeon crawly and it didn't fit the tone that we've been playing in. And it really kind of felt like a, suddenly a different game. Um, I've made it very clear. I love Shadow Dark and I love dungeon crawls, but this isn't... The Shadow Dark that we're playing here is obviously pretty modified and this isn't a dungeon crawl so far. We haven't played it that way at all. And so suddenly to kind of go into like this dungeon mode where they're like, all right, I check the, the door. Is there anything there? You know, I, I didn't roll for random encounters, but, you know, it was very clear. They're like, okay, we're entering a dungeon. And, and the, the mood just shifted. It went right back to D&D. &D. And it, so it, it, the, the catacombs, this section was a little bit of, an, of a disappointment, at least for me. I'm sure maybe the players enjoyed it. I'm not sure. It was certainly weird, and it was certainly a cool moment with the transformation, even though the immediate moment of the transformation was a little anticlimactic, simply because most of the players were like, yeah. Although, again, the one player did really good, uh, did really well with that. And, of course, the, the, the player who was playing Pavel, I think, enjoyed the opportunity to play his actual class, because so far he's basically just been playing a peasant, with, and he has never used any of it, except for you know the ability to, to have advantage on wisdom checks. That's really all he's been using up to this point. And so the ability to actually get his combat going, and his really strong combat, um, was, I think, fun for him. And so that was cool. But otherwise, it was kind of a weird moment, um, I, at least for me. So anyway, they get to room 23, where I had on my, my um, sheet, it's this sort of dark totem room. Yeah, with ghouls protecting the strange totems. And I realized, no, I don't want a ghoul down here. I don't I don't really want this to be like a combat zone. Why would there be ghouls down here? I mean, I get it. The cult has done something down here. But I, I, I don't really get it. So there was this... Um, I just basically changed it on the fly. Instead of having these four strange totems already in shadow, what I had was this the image of Ravenloft smudged out in blood on the walls, on the four corners of the walls. And that people had been sort of sacrificed below them. So I had these desiccated, drained, burned almost looking corpses below each of the symbols. And when they investigated them, they saw that they weren't that old. Um, but they, the bodies looked old, but the, the, the clothes that were still shredded onto them looked pretty new. They looked like commoners' clothes. And so this looked like they had sacrificed them down here. And in the tomb, the holy symbol was gone. So I just removed the door to 24 entirely and, that, and this, and I just had everything be in 23. But the holy symbol, which was supposed to be in the tomb of Father Arcady, was gone. I think I'm going to make that um, the holy icon of Ravenloft. So if they happen to find it, in Ravenloft itself. I think that's what I'm going to have that have been. Now, I don't know if they'll ever run into it or what, but I think just in my mind, at least, that's what that was. So that's why the cult came down here and took it. Because the holy symbol of Ravenloft, or the, the holy symbol of, uh, the icon of Ravenloft, was buried down here with Father Arcady. Or at least the equivalent thereof. So they knew it was down here, they knew it was powerful, and they took it. And in its place, they left what I described as this sort of bone totem cage like a triangular or pyramidal cage. Uh, it was open, so you could reach into it, but it, you know the, the structure of it was pyramidal. And inside it was this sort of, I described it as like an aura or a, a silhouette, like a, like a candle uh, aura, but instead of that bright you know, light that comes, surrounds a candle, it was a shadow. So it was this like shadowy thing. And so the priest held up his light cantrip or his light spell to it, and it sort of dispelled it, it like evened it out, and in that darkness, that in the natural darkness sort of of the, ca the two canceling each other out, they were able to see that there was like a droplet of like red blood floating. Now in my mind, this is one of the droplets of Strahd's blood. And it, it was used down here in some ritual to corrupt this place. So they picked it up and they threw it against the wall and it shattered, and I described it, the blood hit the wall, this little droplet, and then like sizzled like acid burning into the wall, the stone of the wall, and then it you know, that, that sort of acid fume dispelled and it, it ended. And then I described how the shadows lifted, the cold sort of lifted, and everyone felt a little bit lighter. And I gave them all a point of stan uh, sanity, stress back. So they were like, we don't know what that was, but something was different. Honestly, I don't really know what that was. Um, I had this dark totems on the map, on in my PDF, uh, my document, I should say, that I wrote, and I, I don't know what it even did. I had this idea that it was sort of the cause of all the undead rising. But I, I still used Undead after this, and I think that that's more related to what's going on up in Ravenloft. So I, I think it was just kind of a holdover from my initial notes here. Um, but they didn't really um, they didn't really interact with it. 
I mean, they shattered it, and uh, then they left. And then they really just left. They didn't go investigate any of these other crypts. They didn't go investigate 22. I described how there was, like, a breeze coming down from 22, from up ahead. And again, I, I think I, what I decided that was going to be that was a tunnel that connects down to the reservoir below the city that had been hacked out very recently. So, okay, then that, that's a connection down to below the city. Now, all of this stuff could still be, like, a return at later date and investigate. I don't think it'll happen, but, you know, it could have been. It could be. So, like, at some point in the future, I might put uh, the holy symbol down there in the reservoir, and they have to go get it. That's where the holy symbol of Ravenloft is, right? And they'll find the holy symbol of Arcady, Father Arcady, down there. Or maybe I'll put the cult had something down there that they found. No, or who knows what. But I could, I could still put something in the reservoir, and they would now know that there are a couple ways down there. There's, there's below the church, and there's also through the well. Anyway, um, they left. They left the catacombs, and they went back up to the surface. Now, at this point, they got back to the main church, and Pavel, the beast, was like, I still have this beast form, and it'll last until I take a rest. I don't want to waste it. I want to go fight the vampire. I want to go find Donovich and kill him. And uh, the players were like, yeah, we could do that. And Arthur uh, was like, I don't, I don't really want to do that. And I don't think I'm going to be terribly helpful there because I can't do any kind of magic damage. Uh, so far, the other three party members have ways of doing magic damage, but he doesn't. So he's like, I, I don't really think I'm useful there. And Doro was like, I'm not going to go. Or they were like, we shouldn't take Doro, I think is what they said. So they're like, okay, what we'll do instead is we'll break open the tomb, or the, the, the altar, and we'll take the... Uh, We'll take the relics of St. Constantine from inside the, the, the altar. And and then we'll, or, or rather, we're, we'll go deal with the vampire and then we'll do that. And you, Arthur and Doru, you guys wait outside. So Arthur and Doru went outside and the three other players went and investigated the upper rafters. And eventually they found their way into uh, this back, uh, oops, into this room here, 14. Um, now I, I changed it a bit. I didn't want. I didn't like this idea that there were. Again, you know, I go on the fly and I change things on the fly as I'm feeling it. And just the tone of it, I didn't feel like crawling around the rafters with a bunch of bats up there. Just fit what people were doing and the mood of the game. So I just entirely changed it. I just said, no, no, no. There's an organ back here at the back of nine instead of a table. So it was an organ. I got rid of all of these beams and things, and I said that you can see an, a, a sort of balcony across that overlooks the church, but it doesn't look like there's any way to get there from this side. Now, I think if they had investigated the pipe organ, I think they would have found, like, a secret door that led into, like, a, a secret, you know, hallway that led across the other side. I think that's what would have happened. And maybe they would have had an encounter with a zombie or spiders or something in there. But they didn't do that. They just went back down and went back to the nave. And then they went back to the sacristy. And I said that in uh, in the room of Father Donovich, which they found back here, there was, in fact, a, a stair or a, a, a ladder that led up. And so they went up, they pushed, you know, there was something heavy placed over it, and they broke it open. And they found this, like, big box. The, the windows had been covered, and there was a big box uh, on the floor. And Pavel rips it open, and there is Father Donovich, resting in repose. And so they take a stake, and they stab it into him. And so what happened was, it, you know, the, in Shadow Dark, the stake kills a, a creature when it's at zero hit points. But Father Donovich wasn't at zero hit points. So I said that the stake dealt damage to him. I had him roll a d6, but then he awakens. And so I think this is how I'm going to play it now, that like vampires, unless they are actively attacked during the day, um, they will wake up when you attack them. So you can, you can, if you can be clever about it, maybe you can kill them during the day uh, by pouring them holy water on them or by you know, exposing them to sunlight. But if you like stab a stake into them and they are not um, at zero hit points, then they'll take that damage and they will react. So uh, that's what happened. Because I didn't, I wanted this to be a big fight. I wanted Pavel to be able to use his ability, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just going to change the way I was going to run vampires, because in the moment it was, it was much more fitting for them to have a bit of a fight here. So they jam this thing into him. He wakes up, and I described how it, you know, I said roll initiative as combat goes, and he won initiative. So he leaps on top of Pavel and bites him, and he bites him twice and does a whole bunch of damage and drains a whole bunch of hit points and heals himself. And I said that the stake, like, pushed its, or like, it, like, you know, was exuded out of his body and fell to the floor, clattering as the wounds closed themselves. And they're like, uh-oh. And then they went in a whole round of combat, and they did a bunch of damage to him. And then I rolled for initiative again, and he won initiative again, and he got all of it back. 
like all but two damage. And they were like, and, and then he attacked and did a ton of damage to Pavel again and drained his constitution further. And they were like, we are in very serious trouble here. So then um, they tried to turn him. And the priest, Ulysses, raises his holy symbol and he rolled a natural 20. He got 20 and I think his total is plus five. So he got a 25. And the creature rolled a 14 total, which means less than 10. Uh, he is destroyed. So I, I'm, I, I, in the moment, I also decided what that means. That means that at least for feral vampires, I don't know yet for vampires or greater vampires, but at least for feral vampires, that reduces them instantly to zero hit points. So in repose, he immediately goes back to down in his repose state at zero hit points. And I described how he his eyelids were fluttering, but he was down. And then they take the stake and, and strive it into him, and that killed him. And then they cut off his head just for good measure, once he has uh, a regular dead body again in the cut off its head. So it was an intense fight because they, they had the advantage, they jammed it in, he woke up, and then immediately started really just crushing them. And if it hadn't been for that very powerful turn on dead, they would have been in serious trouble. So it was an awesome moment. Once again, turn on dead came in clutch. It's what's saving them, really. It's, it's what's allowing them to kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, this, with these vampires, with this, sort of, with this sort of campaign in this way. And they were able, they were able to do it, and it was great. Only after that, because uh, I had mentioned that all the windows were like really bent, like closed up and boarded up, and you know, f filthy mattresses had been pushed against them and stuff like that. Only after the fact <laughs> did anyone think, "Hey, we could have just let the sunlight in." But then one of the players was like, "Well, I thought of that, but I didn't know if it would work because when we brought Sorvia out into the sunlight, she didn't die, and I knew that was going to cause trouble long distance. So, uh, I, you know, we'll figure it out." Um, but uh, but it was it was still a cool moment. I think it was still a really cool moment, and it really brought the tone back in. Now, meanwhile, they also went down to the altar and got the the uh, the um, relics out of there, which now means they have a plus one. It's, it takes up a slot, but you give plus one to turn on dead if worn or carried. So the priest is carrying that. So now he has plus one to cast. He also got the book of blessing. So now he has the blessed spell. It also takes up a slot, but he now can cast the blessed spell from the book that he has. So he got a lot stronger in this encounter in this adventure. Um, after this, because Pavel had taken so much damage, he described how he like kind of slumps to the side and returns to his human form. And they threw like a dirty blanket over him because he was totally, you know, he shredded all of his clothes. And then they went back outside. But by that point, Arthur had let Doru go back to the tavern. So they were like a little worried, oh, what if Doru tells on us? What if Doru tells that, you know, Pavel is actually a beast? So they went to back to the tavern and there was no trouble. And some, some of the party went to investigate Dr. Maxim's and he was gone. He's not there, hasn't been there. So they left and went back to the inn. And when they got back to the inn, um, I described how they saw Ismark and they saw Mary and they saw Vanya and they saw the, a couple of the children. They didn't see all of them. And they saw this guy. They didn't see that lady. And, and I didn't mention Irina. And so they were kind of talking for a bit. I'm like, okay, this is what we did. Okay, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. And Arthur goes, hey, where's Irina? And the party all sits there for a minute. And Ismark's like, I don't know. I haven't seen her since... And then he kind of runs off and goes around and starts asking things in Barovian, and the players are like, oh, no. And then he goes and he, he comes back with the little girl, Marta, uh, the, and she has this little piece of paper, and he reads it, and he's furious, and he says, Irina's gone. She said she's sick of it, and she's gone to the Zerpool, and we're not to follow her. Because she's going to find out who killed her father. She's going to find out if the Vistani are involved. She's just done waiting because she's been promised it. She's been drugged. She has been, you know, lied to by Maxim. She has been treated like a child by a couple of the party members and by her brother. And she's just sick of it. She's done. She's scared and she's stressed and she is determined to get revenge. She's very willful. Um, and she wants to find her father's killer. And so she just, and the person who attacked her. And she's convinced that they're a Vistani. So she just left. And I described they had been gone at this point for a couple hours. And so they asked, when was the last time anyone saw her? And the last person seen was like right after they left. So she has at least two hours on them. And she knows where she's going. And they don't necessarily know where they're going. So they were like, oh, no. And, and Ismark was like, look, either you go after her or I do. Right now. Now, this all made sense to me in character. I think all of the characters would do what they did. Irina would leave, Ismark would, would declare, at least as I've been playing them. What I felt, though, that meta, I felt like I had backed my players into a corner because they beforehand they had had at least two choices. There was wait another night in town or go off and try to re try to get to Velaki. And they had sort of settled on the latter. They had said, no, we're not going to spend another night in town, although one of the players was like, I still think we should. But they had decided, no, we're not going to spend another night in town. 
But then I had Doru suggest this church thing, and that was sort of a way of... They could have said no. They could have ignored it. They didn't have to go down there. Um, but they decided to. They wanted to spend time in church. They wanted to clear it out and be completionists, as one of the players said. So they did that. They wanted to do it. And as a result, um, they lost Irina. She left, and she's going to go there. So I think it makes sense that given their choices, this, there's this consequence. But it does feel sometimes, like when I was thinking about it, even at the moment, even at the time I was thinking, I was like, I feel like I'm kind of forcing their hand. Because, I mean, they could choose not to go rescue Irina. It's true, they could. But I, I, I hope I don't, I haven't made them feel like they are supposed to go to the Zerpool camp. Which, like, they kind of are, but they're also not supposed to do anything. Like, they can do whatever they want. Um... And if they had played it differently, I think they all recognized that it wouldn't have happened this way. If they had been kinder to Irina, or if they had told her, hey, we'll stop there on the way, or, or you know, um, if they had convinced her that it wasn't important to do it, like whatever it was, they hadn't, they had just sort of said, no, 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 be quiet, we'll take care of it. And so I think they recognized, okay, yeah, it made sense for the character to do this. But now we kind of have our choice made for us, right? We have to go rescue her because Ismark, either we leave Ismark uh, to go to the woods alone, after his sister and we stay with the town which he suggested was an option or we go and he stays with the town so again it felt i don't know if any of the players like three of the players at least i know the three who haven't really run games they seem totally fine with it they were like yep and one of the players was like this makes sense this makes sense we should have seen it coming of course this was going to happen of course she was going to leave like so i think they knew that it was reasonable but one of the players i just get the sense and I think I've gotten the sense now from this session and last session that he kind of sees, okay, I see why you're doing that. I see why you're doing this. And of course, you know, as a game master, that's fine. You're going you're gonna to have players who know tricks and, and, and things like that. I'm not trying to trick the party to go to the Zerpool. But on the other hand, I think it would be cool if they go to the Zerpool. And I think it also makes sense that that was one of the places that... Well, anyway, so... Long story short, they decided to go to the Zerpool right away, and so they just basically left right then. And I just, the last scene was them walking off into the mist at like 10 in the morning, because it's really misty now. It's kind of bright mist, but it's still misty everywhere in Verovia. So they decided, okay, we're just going to go. And so that was our last scene, was them wandering off into the mists to go to the Zerpool camp. And so I described, they had, they had figured it out. Um, the Zerpool camp is on the south side of the river, um, so they're going to have to go down following the road a bit and then go down this way now the plan was and they, they sort of told uh is mark the plan okay here's the plan you guys are going to go along the road and if we're going to follow through the path and go to the, the this place and we'll try to finish it off there now if um we will meet up at the bridge basically uh we'll go to the bridge and if if you've passed by make a symbol that you've passed so basically put a can like melt a candle on the bridge or like a little wax right or mark a symbol with chalk or do all of the above and we'll look for that and if we don't see it then we'll know that you haven't made it there so then we'll follow the road back to barovia to find you but if it's there then we'll know that you've passed and so we'll follow behind and we'll try to catch up with you and the goal was to try to make it to uh, i described that there was a little rest house just right about here um that the uh the barovians used to travel when they were traveling from Barovia to Velaki. That right outside uh, the ruins, or at the bottom of the, the base of the ruined path, there's an old, basically, rest house, way house, kind of like a tavern, but not exactly. There's no one, like, permanently there. And so that's where they're going to go, is they're going to try to hit that. So um, I don't know yet what's going to happen. <laughs> I think it depends on what the players do. My my guess is that the the... the, the the party is never going to make it to the bridge. Or, I think it might be cool if the party did make it to the bridge, they make it to this place, and then they're attacked. There. By a whole bunch of stuff. And Ismark is taken to the castle. And the rest of the villagers are scattered or killed. I think that would be a very tragic thing, and I think Irina, it would hit Irina very hard that this is her fault. And I think that would be kind of a cool thing to have happen. Now, not like, you know, I'm not trying to traumatize Irina anymore that she's already been traumatized, but I think it would be an interesting story moment. Now, the players would also be like, oh, we chose to not go with the, 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 the townsfolk. We chose to follow Irina. If we had swapped it, who knows what would have happened. Um, they've already said that they know if they're not with somebody, they're likely to die. Hmm. 
I think there's a fair truth to that. Okay, so what that means is then I, I really just have to make sure that I have prepared the uh, the uh, the Zerpool camp and the Road to Velaki, both of which I already have. Now the Zerpool camp, I have a bit of information here. I'll close that down. I know that Madame Eva is trapped in a trance by Baba Saga and cannot awake. The Vistani and Barovia are divided on what to do without her guidance at the Zerpool camp are the following with Sunny. We've Uncle Stanimir, his cousin Dami the Dancer, who's a spy for Luvash, her brother Ratka the Hunter, his wife Grilsha the Merchant, her sister Dasha, Laszlo and Tereska, Zolt, and 25 other Vistani. Madame Eva's camp is totally off limits. And then there's this happening. So I know what's going on there. And I also know that um, Sorvia, who's got, sorry, Alenka and Mirabelle are also there. The two half Vistani from Barovia. They're also there. So I'm going to add that in. Um, uh, Mirabelle and Alenka are now also here. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, I know that... Luvash, right here, is, um, the question is, and this is the real question, do I want Luvash to have taken her off the road? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. I think Luvash has taken Irina. So when they get to the Vistani camp, Irina's not there. Um, and, and Luvash has taken her either up to the castle or to his cabin. And that will give the players time to, okay, great, what do we do? Do we go back to town to try to find them? Do we go ahead? Do we keep searching for her? Um, maybe there's some sign that she was, like, near the camp. And that's it. Um, but I know I know what's what's on the road to Velaki. I've already also prepared... Uh, oh, that's not it. I've also prepared... Um, those encounters. So I know the Svalich Wood and I know the Barovian Basin. So I have these two um, possible uh, encounters. Now, I've used these characters' names, so I have to change these names. Uh, we're going to do uh, Yeltsin, um, Brilka, and their daughter, um, Sish Sisha. 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 Uh, I know we can just send Falka. That's all true. And then um, Annika and Tarina are out there. They can still find them. Um, this is this can all happen. Harugan and Aliasha. That still also can happen. And then Yalera, Dasha, and Rogi have also used. So we're going to use Yalera, um, Hana, and um, Yuli. All right, um, Petrov Maskar Mar Markasovich, the Black Cloak Writer, Barovian Basin, Mujena. This is all good. All right, so we're going to save that. So I know now what the uh, Svalich Woods, the Barovian Basin, and the travels on the road to Velaki are like. We have Frogan Marinsky. We have two zombies attacking the place with a ghast who's eaten the boy. And then we have uh, wolves led by an alpha. So that's all possible. Um, but here's what I'm thinking. The players get to the Vistani camp. And then they find um, the Barovians there. Or sorry, they, they maybe they, you know, because here I'm, I'm placing it all together. They follow her to the camp. They get there around 2 in the afternoon, 3 in the afternoon, after going slowly following her trail. Um, by about 3 o'clock, they arrive at the Vistani camp. She's there. But they're holding her something like hostage because she's sniffing around asking questions. She started causing trouble and they have her there. So the party had then have like, okay, what are we gonna do? So that's what I'm gonna say. Um, Zerpool camp. Uh, Zerpool camp. Um, so, Irina, Irina's visit. So Irina has been Irina has been captured and is being held in, uh, let's see, um, Drasha's uh, wagon. 
they don't know what to do with her because um, they have, they are aware that Lubash wants her. Some want to give her to him when he comes that night. Others want to set her free. If nothing else happens that night, Luvash, Gertruda, and the creatures from the Barovian town attack, which is, if I go back to that document, so basically here's my thought, is that instead of having that whole big attack happen there, it happens at the, uh, it happens at the, uh, it happens at the, what am I thinking? Um, the Vistani camp. So, Um, so I can still have that big climactic moment. So we go cultist is an extradition. Vampire spawn is dead. Donovich is gone. So this is gone. Um, dead. Eight thugs. Six zombies, two ghouls, and Luvash himself. That's it. Um, Doru is gone, Vanya's a worker, is Mark is a soldier, Irene is a thief. So, uh, uh, one, uh, two in six that any Vistani is a thief. Number 39. Two in six that any Vistani is a thug. Uh, number 40. Any other Vistani are peasants. So I'm not sure if they're allies? Question mark. Well, yeah. Irina's a thief, and that's how it goes. So it's going to be this big thing. I think that's a cool moment. And that would be the end of our season one. Quote unquote, season one. So they get there, they have these conversations with the Vistani, they talk about what's going on, they negotiate her release or her. They figure out the truth of what's actually happening here. And then those Vistani that want to keep her along with these creatures, if the sun sets, then these things chase them down and come to the camp. And if not, then that's that. All right, so I think that's it for the next session. I have what's going to happen. They're going to go to this place. They're going to they're going to have the tr trip there, and I have encounters in the Spalich Woods, which I can have at least one. It'll be kind of interesting. One of those ones, I'll roll a d4, and uh, one of those encounters will happen. I'm not going to roll for a. I'm going to roll for a random encounter, but I'm not going to roll for which one. So I'll roll for one of these: Hrugan and Alasha, Ghostly Fog, d4 plus one Wolves. Which at this point, I think I can actually up this encounter because I think they're stronger than that. I'm going to put two d4 plus one hungry wolves. So three to, three to nine wolves. A pair of women offering uh, this attack, which leads, leads to Luvash's hideout, where uh, she is not, but they will know that there's a place there. And then this uh, Yeltsin, Brilka, and Sisha looking for Falka, and uh, they can have this strangle thing if they want to do it. If not, they will just pass on. So they'll have one encounter, they'll get to the camp, they will see um, the Vistani, and then they'll figure out how to deal with that, and they might figure out they might just try to sneak in and rescue her they might try to negotiate they might try to start a feud they might ask hey say hey we'll help madam ava and uh, if we can help madam ava then then that would be great because then i could have them go into the woods and say okay here is a you know here's a quest to go rescue madam ava it's not that baba la saga has just enchanted her period it's that nearby 
there is this, uh, down the road a ways, there is a, an old witch circle, and it's been enchanted, and you have to go break the enchantment, and then something will fight them there, right? Maybe the witches will appear, uh, maybe a hag is there, a servant of Babala Saga, and then they can fight it and have this big climactic fight, and they'll come back. Madame Eva will have been freed. They'll say, okay, we can give you uh, Irina back now that you've rescued Madame Eva from this, and Madame Eva will advise them, and then the camp will be attacked, and that will be the end of the, the, the uh, episode, the end of the season. So they'll get all the information. They'll know actually what's going on. They'll have a big fight, and then they'll have the cliffhanger for the next quote-unquote season. All right. Well, I hope this has been interesting. Um, I know it's been a few weeks since we did an update like this, since I did an update like this, but um, we finally got to play. And we're going to play again next week, which will be the last one before Halloween. So I'll have another one probably on Halloween to let you guys know how it went. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great week. See you then.